Okay, so the media, the mass media. Um, so we have talked about the Constitution, uh, background ideas, background debates, the system that it created, federalism, civil liberties and civil rights, the way these things developed over time. <clears throat> Then the major institutions created by the Constitution, Congress, the presidency, the judiciary, the federal judiciary. Uh, now the rest of the class will be devoted to what people sometimes call political behavior, okay? So when citizens vote and when they form party identification and party allegiances and when they prefer one policy or another, or when they choose not to do these things, when they choose not to vote or when they, they move away from a party or don't, don't really think that either party represents them, what what is motivating them those can be difficult questions to answer for certain okay so um we're kind of looking for evidence of certain things uh but you know looking at political behavior what actually motivates people when they're doing some of these things and one of the well the first thing that we'll look at is the question of the media right what is the media's role in uh politics and we're kind of talking about the mass media in particular what does that mean okay the mass media is by media, we mean basically the, the way that something uh, travels, right? The medium, or when you're talking about more than one media, the means of communication, okay? And when we're talking about mass media, which we are when we're talking about politics in the 20th, 21st century, okay? We're talking about things that reach masses of people, okay? They can be, first of all, they, they reach the people, they're not super expensive, and they can usually be consumed relatively quickly and without too much time or without too much mental effort. So television, radio, newspapers, now obviously the internet, and really for a long time now, at least 10 years, the internet, 20 more than that, okay? Mass media are these means, that, these means of popular communication that reach the masses, reach large numbers of people, and again, communicate in a way that can be understood quickly with relatively little effort, with relatively little background knowledge and so on, okay? So we're not talking about, you know, a 500 page book on the history of the presidency or something. We're talking about uh, something that everybody can see and absorb pretty quickly, okay? Reporting uh, the news uh, and obviously the media, there's some skepticism, there's some distrust of the media, uh, but, you know, reporting the news is different from public relations, right? Public relations is basically the attempt to manipulate public opinion to make your, maybe the, you're the person that you're speaking for, maybe it's a celebrity, maybe it's a politician, obviously maybe it's a corporation, right? Public relations is the attempt to make the public view of your client uh, positive, okay? Reporting is supposed to be more critical and really investigating what's actually happening and giving the people the information and the knowledge and the perspective that they need to meaningfully uh, assess that candidate, what they're going to do, that party, that set of policy positions and so on, okay? Uh, so reporting and journalism, very different from public relations, both make use of the mass media, obviously, both make use of the same media channels, uh, but their purpose and their nature is very different, okay? Likewise, we should distinguish between public ownership of something and private ownership of, of a media company, okay? With the internet, obviously we have social media. Obviously there has been some debate recently uh, that will probably continue uh, about you know, how much power social media companies should have to decide who can and cannot use their platforms. But those are privately owned companies, okay? Those are not First Amendment issues. They can be regulated by the government. Private uh, companies are regulated all the time. And social media companies could be regulated much more than they currently are or than they have been, okay? But that's different from talking about the First Amendment and whether or not that's literally censorship in the same way as it's a government were to arrest you for saying something, right? Facebook or Twitter banning you from their service, very different from the government arresting you for saying something, okay? Public actions and public ownership of certain media things and refusing, again, there are gonna be decisions about what can and cannot be put on public airways, okay? That's not necessarily censorship. There are all kinds of things that, that may go into that, okay? But public versus private ownership, uh, remember when things are privately owned, whether it's a social media company or just somebody's blog when they delete a comment, okay? That is, you know, in a loose sense, you could call that censorship, but that is obviously not censorship in the same sort of you know, dangerous uh, way that it is when the government does it, because of course the government has, uh, has the coercive power of the state behind it. Um, if Facebook bans you, you can go on a different thing. You can, you can 
put your ideas out there somewhere else. If the government comes after you for saying something, they may very well put you in jail, right? Um, so it's important to understand that there is a really significant and important difference between privately owned companies uh, banning people or deleting comments or doing whatever. That is not censorship as it is in the same way when the government tries to shut down discussion of certain things or stop people from saying certain things, okay? Um, the media, what does it do? Again, I know there's a lot of skepticism sometimes about the media and oftentimes people think that the, that the news media just tries to tell people what is good and what is bad, tries to get them to like this candidate or like that party and dislike the other one. And obviously you can see some of that. I mean, Fox News is a very crude example of something like that happening. But for the most part, what the, the media's real influence is not telling you, you should like this party and not that party or like this candidate and not like that candidate. It comes with agenda setting, okay? The agenda, the policy agenda is sort of the list of policy topics that people are taking seriously at the time. So it's more the media's role and the way they have a lot of influence is less telling you this person is good and that person is bad or this party is good or you should vote this way or that way. It's more saying these are the important questions. And of course, sometimes, uh, take a classic example, 1992, uh, the, uh, the recession during the presidential election, that was not necessarily hard for people to figure out that that, was, that, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't like that was just the media making that story. Um, but by focusing on that, and again, it was important to a lot of people, so it wasn't an odd thing that they would focus on it, but by focusing on that, it was obviously difficult and created difficulties for the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush, uh, because people tend to expect the president to handle the economy and the economy was not doing well at that time. It also somewhat unexpectedly, not unexpectedly, but this did not necessarily have to happen it really played to the advantage of Bill Clinton, who as a candidate did a very good job of, proje of projecting empathy and making people think that he understood and really contrasting him with George H.W. Bush, who seemed not only like the president who was letting this happening, who was letting this happen, but also seemed like he was cold and indifferent and remote and didn't care and was bored at, have, at the idea of having to talk about it. So in a situation like that, talking a lot about the recession, it wasn't so much that they told people vote for Clinton, don't vote for Bush, or this guy's good and this guy's bad. It was that it really it kind of put Bush at a disadvantage to begin with because he was the incumbent president and people tend to tie the president to the economy. It also, not necessarily by any design or anything by the media, but it really played to Bill Clinton's advantage because he was able to connect with voters and convince them that he understood and that he was sympathetic in a way that Bush was not. Okay, and here in mean form, of course, this is kind of the classic view of what the press is supposed to do. A free press is supposed to watch the government, stop them from becoming tyrannical. Um, and we'll see, we'll talk a little bit later about the way that the uh, press and the media environment and all of that changed in the 20th century, okay? And how it became much more adversarial towards people in power, okay? Uh, a fair amount of consensus, even deference uh, from you know, World War II up until the late 1960s. And then things changed and we got into the situation that we have been in really since then with a fairly critical questioning uh, adversarial press, okay? But here's of course the, the classic view, right? The classic uh, rationale for having a free press and all these things is to prevent the government from becoming tyrannical, to watch the government, to freely pr publish criticism and so on. Okay, media events, mass media, different things lend themselves better or worse to what they call media events, okay? A media event is an event that is staged and, and in the purest sense, a media event, it's supposed to look spontaneous, okay? So it's not just a press conference or a speech or something, it's something that is supposed to make you feel like you're connecting uh, to a politician or you're seeing something uh, that's supposed to look like it's spontaneous. In fact, it's planned. It's supposed to make you relate to the person or have a certain emotional response or an emotional connection to that candidate or that person. Um, but it, it you know, uh, doesn't always work as we'll talk about in a second, okay? Media events are things that probably wouldn't happen or would have little effect without media coverage. And it is in some ways hard to think of pure examples and pure things uh, that, that, you know, uh, purely ca capture that there in the image you can see Ronald Reagan speaking in front of the Statue of Liberty, right? Probably could have given that speech or that press conference anywhere, uses the backdrop to conjure up a certain uh, attitude or set of emotions in people. 
Media events can be staged by officials, especially elected officials, especially presidents, because they tend to get so much attention. So many things that they do might get attention, okay? And they can also be kind of staged in a sort of guerrilla way by people who, are, who can kind of create good politics as theater, good theater, good media theater. If a media event is politics as theater, somebody like the guy who threw his shoes at George W. Bush can kind of seize that and can kind of take, take, get a lot of attention for whatever he's trying to do, at least in the moment. How long would the effects of that be? How much long-term influence will that be? Who knows, okay? But we'll talk about this a little bit. But a media event is something that is staged for the media, but it's not, I mean, a press conference is staged for the media, but that's somebody coming out and asking questions or, or answering questions that are asked by reporters. The media event in the purest sense is something that is supposed to look spontaneous, is supposed to look like something that is happening without any media attention, but of course it is. Politicians, going door to door to talk to voters, politicians firing uh, guns, show that they own guns and that they use them. Politicians, uh, sometimes, you know, showing up digging a, a thing to plant a tree or, or the first foundation of a hospital. Some of these things are more obviously staged than others, but they're all attempts to create something that looks like it's not being done for the media when it really is. And as you start to watch, uh, following these things, you will see media events, they absolutely happen. And you'll know that you're trying to say they're trying to manipulate you with this, okay? Um, media events sometimes go wrong. This is Michael Dukakis, uh, Democratic presidential candidate in 1988. Um, long backstory to this image, but he was basically trying to look uh, tougher, look like somebody who could handle foreign policy. He had been governor of Massachusetts. George H.W. Bush had been vice president. He had a lot of foreign policy experience a lot of reasons why you might think he could handle foreign relations, especially with the Soviet Union and things like that better than Michael Dukakis. Um, so Dukakis kind of tried to stage this thing where he would ride around in a tank and he put the helmet on and, you know, this, you can still debate. And again, it, it's hard to say, right? How much did this really hurt him in the election? Uh, did this cost him the election? Did this dramatic, embarrassing event and image did this actually cost him the election or was it relatively insignificant? It's hard to know for certain, right? But it became a very famous thing and a very clear example of an example of a media event. Because again, this was obviously staged. It's not like he was gonna do this just for his health or because somebody wanted, invited him to do this. It was staged for the media, but it ended up making, making him look ridiculous and really backfired completely. It had the exact opposite effect that they wanted. It didn't make him look stronger or more competent or like a more serious or able uh, person to handle foreign policy, it made him look like a fool or like a child or something. So this, again, a somewhat well-known example, um, old, somewhat old at this point, uh, but an example of a media event going wrong, completely backfiring, achieving the absolute opposite of what it was intended to, okay? George W. Bush landed on an aircraft carrier at the very beginning of the Iraq war, got out, right? Obvious media event. This is obviously stage. Many other ways to get him on that aircraft carrier, if he even needed to be there to give a speech. And this is something that at first Republicans really loved. In fact, this image was so popular, um, they actually made a doll uh, and sold it to people. Um, over time, though, as the Iraq war went bad and as public support for George W. Bush and for the Iraq war, but for Bush in particular, declined and eventually really evaporated. He ended up with, you know, uh, approval ratings like 20 or 25%, very low for a president. Um, this was used and it was kind of used as an example of what was wrong with him and what was wrong with his presidency and the attempt to play cowboy or play tough guy and have no real clue what he's doing, okay? So this is an example of an image, a media event that has a somewhat complicated history, very effective at first, when it was first done in 2003. Um, and again, so effective, people even made a, made a little toy out of it. But over time, people came to see it, not just did it sort of motivate people who didn't like him, who became larger in number, uh, but also came to kind of symbolize what a lot of people thought was wrong with him. Uh, that same thing, he eventually got out of the flight suit, put on his suit or, you know, was wearing it and he gave a speech in front of this banner that said mission accomplished. And this was the very beginning of the Iraq war. Obviously the mission in terms of the war was not accomplished. This became another thing that was somewhat infamous. Uh, there were jokes about it. Uh, there were all kinds of things, right? But the idea that he declared mission accomplished 
this again at the time right was was supposed to be a very powerful he's got all the servicemen behind him he's on the aircraft carrier in the gulf in the persian gulf he's in front of the banner that says mission accomplished he's flown in on a fighter jet he got off wearing the uh the uh pilot's uniform or the, the uh, pilot suit um, and then he gives a speech and it's supposed to look like a projection of power and confidence and competence and you know uh, victory and of course it becomes uh, really kind of well known for being the exact opposite uh, the, the an, an example of <laughs> declaring victory and mission accomplished when the exact opposite is what is happening uh, mission is not accomplished you are just beginning, you are just getting into a complete quagmire that you don't understand that you're not gonna be capable of, of handling at all, okay? So again, another image that meant one thing and had a certain resonance and power originally, and then over time comes to mean something very different. So these media events sometimes can, uh, you know, they can have complicated histories and they can certainly backfire, okay? But again, you can, when you start to think of these things, as media events and as things that are planned and calculated to produce a particular uh, effect in the viewer, in you, and especially a particular emotional effect, you can start to see when, when people are trying to manipulate you and how they're doing it, and hopefully be a little bit more critical and uh, less influenced by those things.